Tyler Dennison. And I'm Kev Bamboo, and this is Rip It Up. Rip It Up is a topical show about life impacting creatives in the world today. Yeah, and on tonight's show, we're joined by professional musician Gabriel Piers Montel, where we'll be talking about living the dream and the impact of COVID-19 lockdowns. But just before we do that, I'm going to live, give a little update on a charity marathon hike that I did just a couple of weeks ago. So far, we've managed to raise around about 500 quid, which is pretty good considering you know the situation and everything. Um, and there's still a few donations coming in, but Milo, I've still not received your donation. I'm sure I mailed the check. Like, I received it. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, that, that, old, <laughs> that old chestnut egg. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely, <laughs> definitely in the mail. Guarantee, guarantee. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mental note of check. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I'll get on that. I, you know, it's funny, I actually was going to donate. Uh, and then I literally completely forgot about it. Like when I was, when I was uh, looking at the site, he's <laughs> feeling, he's feeling guilty now. It's just all the excuses are coming I, up. I'm sure I've got like one pound 50 cents around here somewhere. I can, uh, I can put it in an envelope. Scra- scratch it together. man. Yep. Yep. Uh, <laughs> all right. So let's get into this. Uh, I think it's time we speak to our guest, Gabriel. You prefer Gabe, right? Yeah, Gabe's fine. Any, anything's fine. I've, I've had all, all kind of permutations. So, okay. Yeah, shock me. It's cool. Cool. Well, welcome to the show. And I guess let's just start off with tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, how'd you get into playing keys? I've had a weird kind of path into into the job I do currently. I'll try. It's, it's kind of hard to give the sort of highlights. But basically, I got into keys when I was very young and, and kind of started playing, just kind of improvising and stuff like that. And there's like a photo of me about, I've got a young, three-year-old son, uh, Otto, and then there's a photo of me about his age uh, on the piano, uh, like sort of tinkering away. Um, I'm sure it wasn't anything particularly uh, sort of well-beating, but I was definitely kind of playing like early on. And then I kind of had music lessons and went down a sort of traditional sort of music route, classical uh, lessons. Um, I went to, a, a, I got a scholarship to do jazz at this nearby sort of music school. Uh, called Wells Cathedral School and that was like for two years and then after that I did art college um, and, and and it was special effects for film it was the course that I did that was like three years of that so very different unrelated sort of stuff um, but while I was doing that up in London where I live now uh, I was still gigging and kind of playing with sort of various different sort of bands and uh, playing in, in quite a few different scenes as well which is unusual I think um, for somebody that age it was really fun um, and then after I graduated, I, for various kind of reasons, had like kind of an epiphany and decided I wanted to actually pursue playing. Um, and then there was a long process of kind of putting myself about and, and, and teaching myself what I'd kind of, what I needed to catch up on from scratch. So from then on, I was self-taught really. Um, and so I kind of learned on my job um, and and plus with the yeah, sort of self sort of self-study or whatever you call it yeah and uh, so yeah so now I've been sort of doing this full-time for about 12 years working as a keys player. Do you play in different bands or a specific band or on your own? I play in different bands so I work as a session player okay um, definitely kind of in, in the last five or six years that's been my main kind of thing so it's, it's there's some bands that I play with more regularly um but it's very varied. Like I've kind of done lots of different styles of playing, different scenes, you know. So it keeps it interesting. Yeah. Uh, the invoices are fiddly. It's just like, <laughs> there's a lot of admin. I'm not naturally good at admin. Like lots of, you know, lots of musicians aren't. So that's been a learning curve, but yeah. No, but did you, did you mention that before you fully got into the music that you was going to work for Ardman Animation? Yeah, that's right. So that was the special effects uh, thing. So this yeah. course was, yeah, art for film. And it was all like physical making. So it's like props, prosthetics, uh, very niche. It's like really fun to do. Um, they, they were not necessarily life skills. Like if anybody ever wants like a goblin sculpted, yeah. I'm sure you all are. I'm the guy. Or like, all kind of, there was one thing, one project where I made like a massive pair of nail clippers. We had to like make a big kind of enlarged kind of household object so at the end of the project everybody had oh, like wow. it was like a huge pencil sharpener someone made like a lego man i spent about three months making a pair of of, uh, of nail clippers like this big um, <laughs> yeah 
<laughs> that's, that's, br- that's brilliant, though. I mean, Which is weird. But yeah, make, me, make me a large pair of nail clippers any day. They're still kicking around, that. mate. I mean, if you're in the market, yeah, no one has them so far, <laughs> weirdly, but like they're still there. But, 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 but I kind of made you the stop motion, so I was going to do that. Um, and, and then my final piece was, uh, uh, I think it was like a five-minute short film that I made. I, like, I, I sort of shot it and made all the puppets and things. Um, cool. and it was five minutes long and it took a year to make it took half a year to prep and then the shoot took wow. about yeah six months yeah i'm i'm always so impressed with people that do stop motion like i the the time that goes into it like i yeah. don't have the patience for it because no. of the time that it goes into make it and it's always so impressive to me oh man well i i mean you know, i've only sort of done obviously that little bit of it um and like I kind of think like a lot of people who who play instruments, there's definitely a part of me that's kind of happy to do something very low key uh, in a room on my own for like long stretches of time. Uh, but even for me, stop motion is was hard going. And, and I was animating monkeys, so like little monkey characters. I won't bore you with the plot of the film. It was <laughs> <laughs> no Oscars yet for that. <laughs> but, uh, but it was me in, in like a darkened room for, yeah, pretty much six months very slowly moving a cartoon monkey yeah, that's, <laughs> but all the I mean, weirdly satisfying it's more fun than it sounds but yeah yeah did you I do imagine. your own music for it as well i did yeah 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 um i'm making a mental note to find wherever it's on the internet and delete it after this it's not... <laughs> <laughs> but I did. Exactly. people are going to start searching for oh, it oh man i'm sure <laughs> <laughs> but um but yeah as kind of as you said yeah that that was going to be my job after that so once i graduated I was going to work for Ardman. I, I kind of got like a job offer for, for yeah, Ardman, who people don't know, they're the guys that do Wallace and Gromit. And it's like a big UK uh, stop motion um, studio. And, and I was going to do that. I was going to do like junior model making. Um, and then, uh, yeah, then I broke, broke my arm, falling off a toboggan, which we were chatting about the other day. And that's one of two <laughs> toboggan related accidents that I've had. I've actually broken another bone falling off a toboggan. Um, but during the course of the kind of fallout from that, I had to sort of have a big, deep and meaningful about my life. And yeah, it was, I decided to do music. So money well spent. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> no, no, definitely. And I mean, obviously yeah. what a, what a kind of, you know, thing just to get a position with Ardman and then have yeah. that, like say that kind of define, almost a, not a defining moment, but a moment that was like, I actually broke my arm. I want to focus on my music a little bit more. Yeah, and yeah. It, it, is, it is interesting with that as well, because obviously music and the kind of current era that we're in, COVID-19 obviously had, you know, a big impact on you and the music industry as well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you could tell us a little bit about how that impacted yourself and yeah, how, you adap- sure. how you adapted as well. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, it, so what it's, so I remember the last gig I had before all this kicked off. And, and it was a gig up in Newcastle and, and the news was just kind of coming in about all this sort of thing. And half of the band were really positive and they were like, it's going to be fine. It's just all like, it's going to blow over. It's like the flu or whatever. And then the, the grumpier half of the band, uh, which included me, many of them parents, like the sort of dads of the band were like into, all sort of together in a room, like kind of being a little bit less positive. And we were all convinced that it was going to be fairly massive. Um, but we didn't know how soon it was going to hit. We kind of got the sense that it was kind of coming. And that was the last gig any of us did for like 12 months, you know. So we, we kind of thought that it would be bad. And then we, we all kind of went back home. And that was it, you know, uh, lockdown started. And initially it was kind of uh, very stressful, you know. And we were kind of in panic mode, kind of working out how we were going to make things work. And then after about like a few weeks, we sort of got a bit more of a sense of... of of what it was going to look like and, and realised that we were just about going to be okay. You know, we were lucky. We still had a game plan and stuff. And then from then on for about a kind of sort of nine to 12 months, although there were some really hard periods where people that I knew got ill and stuff like that. Um, but that aside, there were some real positives. So it's like the first time that I've really had a, a break, like a proper break for like a long time. And by that, I mean, not just time off, but time off with no prospect of work, you know, yeah. um, like for lots of freelance people, even when you kind of have time off, you're still kind of keeping an eye on like, ah, there's this gig I've got to learn or, or, or I should be doing more 
promotional stuff or whatever. And so it was really nice actually having that pressure like lifted. So that was quite nice. And also seeing my kids and my family was mega. Um, so I was just looking after my boy like during lockdown. Um, and that was great, you know, because it's, it's, you know, very rare for anybody, but particularly anybody who works in kind of freelance as well a lot. To, to have that opportunity to just chill with their family. So that was really great. And then after Christmas, traditionally, musicians at that time of year, it's generally quite a quiet time of year. And for whatever reason, generally, it's quite kind of bleak. Um, something a lot of people talk about is, ah, oh, January is miserable and there's no gigs and you're left on your own to sort of worry about all your stuff. And, and, and from then on, it became quite challenging. And I, I sort of felt quite sort of, I was definitely really ready to play again. Um, and so that was a kind of a trickier period. But then, you know, gigs have started to come back. Uh, and it turns out, yeah, I, I need to play the piano to be sane. And I think my wife was relieved. I think she was <laughs> <laughs> quite happy to sort of, uh, you can have too much like, of a good get, thing. Get out. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah. So it hasn't been like, there's been some positives, definitely. Yeah. Did with, there, with the lockdowns, because in the UK we had one lockdown, then they kind of let us out of lockdown for a short period of time towards the end of last summer and then locked us down again. Yeah. Were you getting any bookings during that brief period where we weren't in lockdown? Because it was kind of a partial yeah. lockdown, if I remember correctly. Yeah. yeah, I did get some bookings. So so they kind of started to kind of, yeah, there's a few things that came back in. And that was very strange because, again, it's that sort of thing of suddenly getting into gig mode. And then, and it took kind of a while, it takes kind of a while to kind of get back into that sort of mindset, you know, and, and then I, I kind of finally got myself into kind of that, that sort of gear, like performing kind of gear. And then it was lockdown again, but I was still in that kind of <laughs> slightly kind of wired space. So again, I think there's was, there was a lot of uh, my family, my wife being very patient just sort of waiting for me to decompress a little bit. Your wife was working during that time? Yeah, so we've been very lucky. She's a teacher. That's good. Um, and she works at a nearby school. So she was doing uh, Zoom teaching. Um, so and... basically the two of you and a uh, under three-year-old yeah. at house at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> it works. It kind of works surprisingly okay as far as, unless she's being very polite. But like <laughs> the, the party line from her is like, it was fun. <laughs> and I enjoyed seeing you guys. But there was, she would have um, uh, these kind of long uh, Zoom meetings, which would go on for ages and, and would be sort of quite stressful and stuff. Um, and there'd be a point where she sort of said everything she had to say, but she wanted to get out of the meeting. I probably shouldn't say this online. Maybe you can cut this. I don't know. But, um, but she yeah, signal- we'll, we'll sort it. We'll yeah, we'll do yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> but she'd signal to... Uh, me like kind of you know off screen and i and i what i'd give otto my kid like, like some some paintbrushes or something and then just sort of send him into shots and then she'd be like <laughs> i've got to go my kid's trashing a place or that. that's <laughs> nice so he was her red band option so yeah we sort of found some workarounds that were kind of quite good <laughs> i think that's 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 a good advice actually for anybody listening or watching right now <laughs> Yeah. Uh, you need to get off a Zoom meeting and you have a kid in the house, just kind of yeah, have yeah, a, yeah. Work, yeah. yeah. Need <laughs> Give them some scissors. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, but wasn't there a period as well that you, you discovered something that could have potentially ended your career as well? That's um, right. Yeah. During lockdown. That is true. So, so one of the things that was uh, kind of weirdly turned out to be a positive was when uh, all the COVID stuff sort of initially happened there was a a few weeks where we were obviously trying to get everything sorted and we were in kind of panic mode and and during that kind of two or three weeks I didn't play keys uh for the first time in like a long time you know it's like the longest break I've had from playing and when I went back to playing I realized that uh this finger on my on my my left hand uh was really hurting um when I played And, and, and and I also I kind of gradually realized that it actually had been hurting for a long time and I got used to it, you know, and, and it was, it turned out to be RSI, uh, repetitive strain injury or whatever, which is really dangerous for, for musicians. It's like a career killer, can be really bad, it kind of puts you out of action. And, and the best way to sort of treat it is to, I mean, there's conflicting opinions, but basically is to, is to go very easy on it for like a long period of time. And if you are playing, sort of do so very gently and stuff like that. And so it's been really good because I've basically had like, um, 
uh, yeah, the chance to, to rebuild the technique in that hand uh, over the period of like many months, which I wouldn't have had otherwise, you know, I'd have had to play through it really. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's very lucky. If it hadn't been for that, I would have just carried on and it probably could have been quite a problem. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because obviously, I mean, so does it feel like it's a lot stronger now than it does? Yeah. 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 It does. I, I think, I think so. I was playing like a lot of, um, uh, kind of, I sort of set myself because I've got quite small hands anyway. Um, and there's a few pieces, there's a few kind of com classical composers that are sort of notorious for having these huge sort of spreads. Um, they play, they kind of write these pieces. So, like Debussy, so I was like trying to play this Debussy piece, which is like. Uh... <laughs> kind of huge kind of left hand spreads um and, and I, I kind of learned it a little bit previously um and and I kind of could play it comfortably and I noticed that I couldn't make any of those kind of huge sort of huge for me sort of octaves and lines and things wow yeah um so that was like a kind of like a set myself like a task to sort of get that down by the end and so once I finally was able to play it again it was, it was nice because I knew that I kind of managed to get myself back to square one ish you know so it was a nice chance to do that yeah gotta gotta say already massively impressed i'm a big fan of your your oh. stuff anyway like just <laughs> Thank you, man. what a That's... what a guy and Wait, we're, not, yeah. we're not even got sorry come on no i was going to be like what you can't just turn to the left and just start uh you know pointing <laughs> out some uh you know <laughs> classical music <laughs> Come well, on, I thought everybody could do that. Yeah. <laughs> well, you oh, I mean, on, on, a, on a weekend, on a weekend, yeah, obviously. <laughs> yeah, no, well, that is, it's great to finally have a fan. <laughs> so you and my Number parents. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, I'm sure they they are your absolute, you know, massive number ones um, well it's mutual they're great guys no no i was just going to say so obviously like all those changes and things that you've mentioned about you know during lockdowns and the kind of adaptations from covid and all those things um it's kind of obviously interesting because obviously everyone has a different perception and take on things and that kind of bridges us to our kind of public response survey that we do in most of our shows um and on this one we're doing it's about living the dream. And, you know, from some people's perspectives, they may say, Gabe, you know, he's playing all these, you know, great gigs. Don't see anything else that goes on. And they're like, yeah, that dude, that dude's living the dream. <laughs> so, but, but we're going to go and take it to the survey and see what kind of responses we've got to that question that we put, put to them. And we're going to relay, a, relay a few of those and then we'll, we'll discuss that and we'll discuss our own kind of thoughts and, yeah. feelings around that subject so i'm gonna I've get got it. thoughts i'm up for it yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've, I've got i've got a few um I've, milo's <laughs> definitely got some as well oh, that's um, that's all right. yeah so we basically asked the public what is your perception of living the dream and we gave them a little bit of an example just as to, to kind of break them in and it was like do you feel that it's all relative is there a defined blueprint of, of what it should be or maybe for somewhere in between um so yeah, we, we put that out and we had, you know, we had several responses and of, of like the first like multiple choice options, most of the people, they, we had 70, 70, 72% said that it's all relative. Um, nobody in there put that there's a defined kind of blueprint to so a, a perceived living the dream. And um, yeah, a few, about you know, 30% said, that they fall somewhere somewhere in the middle. Um, yeah. They think that there's a little bit of something there, but also that it's, you know, margin, mostly relative. But we had, a few, we had a few comments as well. We invited them to kind of give their own thoughts as well. Um, so I'll just get those up. And it wasn't just me and Milo with all the comments in here. <laughs> <laughs> just making but, stuff in. Yeah. Dave, 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 Dave from, Dave, Dave yeah, from Romford says... Uh, <laughs> So, yeah. Sorry, Dave, from Romford, by the way. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> no, so, yeah, we've got, uh, yeah, we've got several on here. Um, and I'll, I'll read a few of the, the best ones out. So somebody put, I'm nearly 70 and have, in fact, lived my dream. I just enjoy what is left and try my best. 
Yeah. Um, somebody else said, living they the dream. But is... they didn't say what the dream was. So yeah. I mean, no, they, they, they the... didn't. They didn't expand oh, on, yeah. on that actual dream. So we, we might have to tap that person up. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> their brains. <laughs> um, yeah, and another, another guy said, living the dream is relative to each individual person. It's a wholly and totally dependent upon what the dreams and hopes and goals of that person are. Outside forces, opinions, etc., have no bearing and don't matter at all, which is pretty, you know, I like that. Um, yeah, I like and that. someone else says, I think it's relative as living the dream can mean very different things to different people. However, if you want to live your dream, then you have to be intentional about it too. Make it happen. Don't sit back and wait for it to happen. So I suppose that kind of falls a little bit into not necessarily a defined blueprint, but kind of making your own kind yeah. of blueprint towards your relative perception. Um, but I'm going to bring that back to, to you guys um, as well. You know, what is your perception of living your dream? Uh, right, mate. Well, I first of all, I am fascinated to know what the first guy. Yeah. What's the dream? Uh, I am. Yeah. What what's is he his done? dream? Yeah. Because I I know very, you know, I mean, a lot. The majority of the people that I know are musicians, um, and I'm sort of lucky to know quite a few guys that are sort of older than me, further on in their career, career than me, who have definitely achieved other people's uh, kind of blueprints of, of dream living. And, and they don't feel like they've lived the dream. Um, and it turns out it's, it's a very kind of hard thing to do. So this geezer, we need to track him down because he, maybe he's the one person that's sort of hit upon how to kind of get to the end of your career and feel happy. I mean, there, there was a, a famous an interview uh, that Sonny Rollins did um, at the end of his career. A few years ago now, he hung up his horn and he stopped playing sax. I think he had arthritis, I could be wrong, but he did an interview of like jazz magazine. And this is like, you know, one of the kind of absolute cornerstones of, of his instrument. Like he he moved the music forward. Like he was he was, uh, you know, an iconic musician and had you know achieved the dream by like a lot of people's metric. And they and they asked him if, if he had any regrets about his career, and he said something along the lines of like. Yeah, I've just always hated my playing. <laughs> that was the thing. And, and, and which is kind of like an amazing thing to say. There's quite a lot that you can take from that. Like you, on the one hand, you can be like, well, isn't it amazing that this bloke has, has kind of done all this stuff, you know, and, and um, iconic gigs and he's written tunes that are standards and, and all this sort of thing, but he still kind of is feeling all... Uh, dissatisfied and wanting to kind of keep pushing and stuff like that, which is amazing. Uh, There's another small part of me that kind of thought, bloody hell, like, I'd like to at some point feel at least slightly satisfied with anything that I've done, you know. And if Sonny Rollins doesn't, then I think I'm going to have <laughs> <laughs> trouble kind of getting to that point. And I think it, as far as kind of living the dream goes, I think my my blueprint for it personally would be um to be able to make a really like a, a comfortable living um uh doing with a kind of with a, a choice of of different kind of playing different music that i love to do you know and, and kind of playing lots of different sorts of things but but all of it being stuff that i really is up my street and that would be kind of my ideal sort of thing um and, and and to have a balance between that and, and the rest of my life, you know, and I think that's that's the that's the really hard thing. So so not just um, not just financial security, but the creative freedom as well to be able creative to, freedom, to and, yeah, and just general kind of freedom to be able to kind of like have both sides of my life, kind of uh, you know, to to be able to have the time to kind of do both things. Um, and that's a balancing act and, and uh, yeah that's kind of what I'd kind of like to, to do um, but but yeah it's a, it's a real I mean I think anybody who works in the creative field musicians definitely um, partly there is a kind of a, a, a chronic sort of dissatisfaction that, that everybody experiences with with, it, with what they do um, and I don't get the sense that that ever goes away so I don't I really don't get the sense that people kind of achieve you know big kind of uh ostentatious success and then go right that I'm, I'm now i've achieved being good at piano uh from my experience that that feeling of sort of satisfaction actually 
it kind of goes up and down on like a weekly basis. There's some weeks where I'm like, oh man, this is great. I've, I've, I'm good at piano. And then there's some weeks where I'm just like, geez, <laughs> like it's, it's not happening at all. And I think that's a very common thing. And it's something that people don't talk about a lot, actually. But I like to talk about it. Um, Definitely. Yeah. And I um, find that when I do, musicians often pipe up and, and it turns out everyone experiences similar. Yeah. I was going to say, because you touched on it quite nicely then, I think across a lot of creative medium, there is that kind of like self-deprecating factor that yeah. you just, but well, maybe that's what kind of, when you're kind of near the top or somewhere near the top or on your way to the top, it's that that drives you forward because you're continuing to kind of like, you want good, to yeah. improve. It's a good question. I actually think, I know exactly what you're talking about. And, and, and what I actually find is that people, the further, the more supposedly, um, comfortable people are in their status as like a good musician or, or a successful musician or whatever, the, they, they're definitely more inclined to talk about this kind of thing, like uh, insecurity and, and um, you know, all that sort of thing. Um, and my actual suspicion is that they're vocalizing something which everybody up and down the, the ladder experiences, but they just have that little more, that little bit more um, security in their kind of status or whatever you want to call it, that they feel like they can talk about it. I think the, the people that are the least likely to ever express that sort of thing are people who feel like they're on the back foot in their career and people who feel like they haven't, you know, uh, that, you know, they're really at odds with how they feel about themselves. If you have, a, you know, a small degree of success, it actually becomes kind of weirdly easier to talk about all the uh, imposter syndrome and stuff that you suffer from. And uh, so I do think, yeah, it's something that is like a probably a universal thing. I could be wrong, but that's been my experience of chatting to people. Well, it's an interesting subject because I think as, as humans, we do have this idealized where we want to be. And then even if you achieve that, then there's still something else because it's in our nature to kind of want more than whatever it is. It's like billionaires. Why do they need more money kind of a thing? Um, or musicians that, yeah, have reached the top of their field that, you know, why, what else do they need, but, um, or actors or whatever. But I, 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 I think there's that desire to achieve that, that helps us in, in like a creative industry to be creative. Cause I think of musicians as I think is a perfect example of this. I think of a lot of musicians when they're, when they're younger, uh, they, their, their music's, they're coming out with more music. They're doing more music, that kind of yeah. stuff. But then as they get older, I mean, let, look at like Eric Clapton or Rolling Stones, right? All, all great musicians, but like, when was the last time that they came out with anything good, you know, it, but they're still, the Stones are going on tour this year, actually, yeah. and, you know, but they're just going to play all their old stuff. They're not going to do anything new. So it's like the closer you get to that dream, is it the less creative you get or is it, I mean, it could also be an age thing or whatever as well. It's a, yeah. It's a really interesting, I know exactly what you're talking about. I think one of the things is that there's uh, definitely for, for musicians, like a kind of a self-awareness sets in um, as you progress, you know, and, and, and as a session musician, you're, you're almost kind of trained to be able to dissect music to such a degree that you know you hear something you can kind of break it down into its component parts um and and it's almost like a kind of a heightened kind of criticism you know you'll recognize uh you know uh techniques that people have used production techniques to recognize kind of uh chord progression and stuff like that and it makes you and it makes you very efficient at your job but it actually kind of makes you a lot more self-aware uh, of, of what you're playing and how you're playing because you have so much context for it and there's something about when you're younger because you're less well informed and you're less inhibited by that process you're you i kind of think weirdly that does lead to kind of more uh easier and more authentic kind of uh artistic expression you know because you don't know what you don't know but you're able to really emotionally get on board with whatever you're doing i think a lot of the art the great artists who had this kind of period when they were younger of, of just unbelievable kind of uh, inspiration you know it's often the same it'll be like a kind of three or four album period where they just kind of churn out this amazing stuff and then there's a point where it suddenly kind of starts to subside a little bit um, my suspicion is that what's going on there is during the three or four album period, they are so kind of emotionally engaged with what they're doing 
um, and focused on it and, and kind of uninhibited, that they're able to access whatever it is that leads to, to profound creativity. But there comes a point where, like, you know, album, you know, whatever album it is, where suddenly, you know, you're aware of the need to kind of be experimental, you know, you're aware that people are wanting something from you, you know, and then comes the album where everyone's just playing spoons or whatever, or like some kind of weird gimmick. <laughs> yeah. and, and, but it stops being authentic, you know, and that happens. Um, and definitely with playing, there's a, a, a there's a kind of a, a, a something that I've talked about quite a lot that I think is true of me, and I think it's probably true of quite a few different players. And I was chatting to a sound engineer about this last week, and it turns out there's actually a con uh, there's a uh, a term for it, um, but I forget what it is unfortunately. But it's basically I I think that you could draw a graph of people's um, musical development. Uh, and against kind of their own sense of uh, achievement and happiness and where they are. Would that be like a Venn, di is it a Venn diagram, I think? Is that yeah, one? something yeah. like that. Yeah, that, that sounds, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a German sounding name for this. Oh, how bad, I'll, I'll, I'll find it. But when you're very young, your, your technique and ability accelerates very fast. Uh, and you're just like learning all these scales and you're like, oh man, you know, I can play all fast and it's great and and uh, I'm killing it, whatever instrument you know, I play. And and, um, and then there kind of comes a point uh, where you've kind of got a lot of technique down and a lot of kind of scales and things like that, but you, you suddenly realise actually where you sit in the, in the context of everything else. And, and, and at that point, um, the kind of, the self-esteem just plummets. <laughs> And you, and then your your learning curve actually kind of becomes a lot shallower, but a lot more kind of profound. And it's kind of that's the kind of point where you become uh, inhibited, I guess. Uh, but it's also the point where you start to make real progress as a musician, um, and 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 that progress is kind of characterised by. Uh, not kind of how you're doing things, but what you're trying to do with them. You know, there's no 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 good being able to play every chord or scale or whatever if you're not saying anything. So it becomes about how to say something with that language. Um, I've gone on a huge tangent. I don't know. I, 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 I've, <laughs> I've interrupted just... your stuff. So sorry. No, no, no <laughs> you can tell I've been on my own for like a, a year, and I'm so desperate. To... <laughs> yeah. No pro no problem whatsoever, Gabe. But, um some really interesting stuff there and from from my own from my own kind of angle yeah i'm still thinking about the, the guy who is you know got this certain kind of elixir to live in the dream I just, who is he yeah 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 we've got we've got to find him out I mean, yeah I'm yeah sure. track him down yeah <laughs> It is on the subject of living the dream though it is kind of an interesting how opportunity affects that and your effort that you put into it, because I'm thinking, you know, if you live in a place where you don't have the opportunity to your dream is, you know, to be a, a, a piano player. Right. And yeah. maybe you live in a place because you, you mentioned that you started playing when you were three. So that means um, you had a piano. That That's right. Yeah. Yeah. To. Uh, so if you maybe live in a place where you don't have access to a piano, so you still have that dream, like at what point can you try to move down that path or, you know, stuff happens in life and maybe you have to take some job that also interferes with that kind of a thing. So yeah. there is that aspect of opportunity with living the dream and how close to that dream can you get? So, you know, maybe you won't get exactly to where your dream is, Gabe, but you're much closer than say, you know, somebody else might be or same with yeah. you or Kev, you know, we might yeah. be closer to our dreams than another person might be. So it, yeah. It's kind of an interesting thing to look at. Yeah, that's, that's a reflective <laughs> comment, actually. No, yeah. I like that. That's, that's really true. I mean, there's a book I recently read, uh, Michael Lewis or Malcolm Gladwell or one of those guys, and it's all to do with this kind of common idea of the, the self-made man and kind of like what that actually entails and where whichever author that is sort of settles it is that there's no such thing. And there's a kind of a myth surrounding the idea that, you know, e even somebody who kind of comes from you know literally nothing and stuff that the the nature of being a human being is that you meet people uh, along your way who help you um you're you're lucky enough to sort of find yourself in circumstances where you have an extra advantage and stuff like that and i've definitely been very lucky in many ways to have yeah hugely supportive parents and family and friends who've kind of helped me out um 
and and you know to come from the background where I'm able to kind of go to like a, a music school and all that sort of thing. Um, and so yeah, it does sort of change the metric as you say for like of, of, of to what extent do you do you think of yourself as successful? Um, I probably think of myself as more successful if, if if I'd come from a much more disadvantaged background where it was there was less kind of uh, facilities available for me to kind of pursue doing this, you know. Uh, so it's, it's all a kind of a sliding scale, really. Uh, and I think a lot of it's to do with how you feel about your yourself as well. So yeah, but no, that is a very kind of interesting point. It's very relative, I think. But but also talking of that as well, aren't you working on a on a project that helps disadvantaged kids as well? That's right. I'm just starting to to, to work on something. It's called Music for All, uh, and it's a charity uh, that my friend Ian Cullen uh, is involved with. Um, and, and yeah, it's, it's it's aimed at kind of literally that. Really, it's kind of giving uh, children who are at less of an advantage. Um, access to, to music and kind of, uh, and kind of tips and, and uh, some sort of, yeah, general kind of tips and kind of hints and, and uh, some teaching about teaching them how to kind of pursue music. And, and yeah, I, I've, I've, I'm sort of beginning to be sort of involved in that, you know, I'm a sort of uh, low level and, and just kind of have been trying to do a few kind of bits and bobs to, to provide some content for that. And it's been sorry. really nice. Yeah, sorry, go on. Yeah, no, I'm just thinking, so as well as like obviously access to instruments that wouldn't necessarily regularly be, you know, available, is it kind of, does it focus on things like kind of funding and kind of like structure in that kind of pathway yeah, as well? Yeah, I think it does. I think from from, from the, uh, to the extent that I'm involved with it, my, my kind of role has been to just kind of provide some video content where I'm, uh, attempting to share uh, tips and kind of ideas about playing uh, an instrument that will hopefully kind of um, that, that these kids will hopefully find inspiring and, and helpful um, and and yeah just some kind of stuff that they wouldn't necessarily have access to normally um, and it's been it's been a really nice thing to do and, and one of the things as well about about music as a general kind of thing is is, is I love it it's an amazing career but it's very inward facing you know to, to a certain extent and I think it's uh, you know I like to think it's a really uh, powerful job and it, and it and it's very important that we you know, we have live music, we have art and all the rest of it. But in terms of the experience of, of kind of pursuing it yourself, it can be quite a kind of focus, uh, kind of one dimensional kind of plane of focus. So it's really nice to have the opportunity to sort of do something actively for, uh, you know, other people as well. Um, because yeah, it's, it's a very, musicians tend to be very, very kind of focused people who are, um, and a lot of a lot of the kind of the good and bad things about music um, and, and working as a player are to do with how you see yourself in relation to what you're trying to do, you know. Um, and so I think generally it's 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 a very helpful thing to kind of take your eyes away from that a little bit. Um, and that's actually been one of the going back to lockdown. That's actually been one of the good things for me is that I, I'm now because I've got a kid. I now identify not just as a keys player, but also as a, as a dad and stuff like that. And, and that's really good for me. It's kind of, there's something about that that's very sort of centering, um, makes you a little bit more stable as well. Um, so yeah, it's, I think it's, it's good for musicians to have other stuff that they do. Uh, absolutely great. Um, Sorry, what's it called again? Uh, it's called... <laughs> <laughs> God, <laughs> this is so bad. This has been a long week, guys. <laughs> music for all. Music for all. Is there a website or anything that people can go to? There absolutely is. What I'll do, I'll, I'll send you guys a link. I, I wonder if you're able to sort of stick it under here. Since we've been talking about music, you gave us a little sample there. Do you want to entertain us with a little ditty of some kind? Uh, I'm going to play um, I Can't Make You Love Me by Bonnie Ray.
Wow. That was beautiful. Thank you, man. Well played, man. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, it's a lovely song anyway, so that was great. To, yeah. No, oh, thanks, dude. Yeah, I always enjoy playing it. Was the dog uh, chiming in? <laughs> yeah. Is that your dog, Kev? That I keep hearing. Uh, it's, it's, it's my sister's dog. So. Oh, okay. All right. No, nah, no worries. I thought it was Gabe's. <laughs> <laughs> it probably picked up a little more because I was away. So I literally just, I yeah, thought yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd judged my timing right just to <laughs> fill up on, fill up on on the water. But no, um, no, it's beautiful that one. Um, Thank you, brother. Absolutely beautiful. So I had a so weirdly I had a gig. Um, so Bonnie Wright is a big favourite of my dad's. It's, she's kind of a dad favourite generally, I think, and definitely like a, a favourite of mine. And I had a gig, uh, BST in Hyde Park, which is this sort of festival that happens every year. Um, and and it was the ultimate dad lineup. It was an amazing lineup. And it was like Bonnie Raitt, uh, James Taylor, um, uh, who else was it? Uh, Paul Simon was like headlining. It was uh, Sean Colvin um, and Bonnie Ray, obviously, who wrote that song, which is like, uh, yeah, one that's sort of both me and my dad. Loved. And, and my dad, and, and, and then a band that I was, uh, that I played with, War Thomas, were also on the bill. We were like first on the bill. Nice. Um, and uh, my dad came along. Uh, I got him a ticket to come and see, and, and so he kind of came along. Uh, and sort of watched our gig sort of backstage, which was great, hilarious for, for me, just sort of seeing him sort of seeing me at work. Um, and, and it stressed him out. <laughs> he, was, <laughs> he was sort of there watching us build all the kind of the rises and stuff behind the stage. And he was just like looking at all the cables. He's just like just watching us. There's like so much that can go wrong. I was like, yeah, that's right. This is why I get stressed. <laughs> but then afterwards, we we went and saw the whole sort of thing. But we, yeah, we watched Bonnie Ray. And afterwards, we both went back and, and met her. Oh, um, nice. Which was like awesome. a, it was a super nice moment. And it was, yeah, nice to do that with him. It was wicked. He rang me a while ago out of the blue and said, uh, he was like, you know that that gig that we were, that, that festival, that thing? And he's just like, I think that's one of the best days I've ever had. I was like, oh, that's, that's super nice. It's like, over the, the, you know, what about the, the birth of your four kids? So, and he like genuinely thought about it. He was just like, no, I think, <laughs> I think I prefer that. <laughs> I was like, oh, good. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but no, uh, it was that's a really nice, nice actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I like that. I mean, it would just yeah. be cool, yeah, getting to meet her and everything as well. Yeah, which, which is cool. Yeah, which is pretty nice. Yeah. She's awesome, man. Yeah, she's a really and, cool person. And what, and what a lineup as well, anyway, just at that, at that festival. Yeah. Oh, I know so, that would be a great show to go Awesome. To. Yeah, 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 it was it was mega. Um, even the musicians, you know, like it, for James Taylor with Steve Gadd on drums, and, and he's just like one of the most iconic players around. Um, and uh, really funny, I could see the drummer from the band that I was with had got backstage. I was in, I was in the, the crowd, but from from my position, I could see him backstage watching Steve Gadd. Uh, his face was a picture, <laughs> but it's kind of <laughs> sort of shock. <laughs> but he was loving it, man. Yeah, it was cool. So this part of the show, Gabe, is where you get to turn the tides because we've been asking you quite a few questions. So you get to ask Milo a question, which is our Ooh. feature called Ask an American. So, <laughs> nice. Yep. Yeah, take, it, take it away and ask him anything you like. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> let's go. Milo, I've, I've, I've been trying to think of, because Kev mentioned this, I've been trying to think of a, a specifically uh, American-facing question to ask you. I don't really have a, a, a kind of a, a question sort of per se, but I was interested to talk to you about uh, confidence because, of the, and this is kind of goes back to some of the stuff that we discussed previously. Um, but I've played with a few American musicians and all of them have been lovely. Um, and one of the things that struck, has, has kind of struck me is that they have a different kind of, of natural kind of, you could call it confidence or kind of, I don't know, just a kind of a comfort with uh, success and kind of talking about uh, things that they've done well and all that sort of thing. Um, they had kind of, in a way, which is different to a lot of people from the UK. Uh, and, and this is obviously huge, you know, very kind of broad strokes and, and sort of big generalizations. But I wonder if there's, if there's some truth in it that, that maybe there's a kind of a cultural kind of, um, uh, there's a different kind of cultural take on, on sort of talking about that kind of stuff. I had a gig at Ronnie's a while ago. I know, but back, it wasn't even a gig, it was a jam back in the day. 
uh, I was in the audience and, and we were all sort of, you know, it was full of musicians. We were all kind of getting up to play. And this fella came over and we just sort of got chatting. And he said, he was just like, oh, you're going to get, and he was from America. And he said, are you going to get up and play? And I was just like, oh, yeah, maybe. You know, I was just like, uh, I'll see how I feel and stuff. And, and, and I was like, how about you? He's just like, yeah, definitely. Uh, he's just like, I'm probably going to kill it. <laughs> I was just like, oh, you mate? He's just like, yeah, I'm really good at drums. <laughs> and I was just like, and I was just like, look at that. You know, that's quite a, uh, you know that that's a strong flavor but also i part of me thought like that must be so nice to just be able to kind of you're like yeah i'm i'm great you know i believe in myself and i'm about to smash this gig and fair play to him he did get up and he was pretty good at drums <laughs> it turned out um now obviously i know that not all americans are like that and, and but but in a it's a kind of exaggerated kind of um example of something which i have noticed which is uh, more of a sense of being at ease with success uh, and being able to talk about it. Does, does any of that ring true with you at all? Maybe. I mean, it could be true, like a uh, compensating for a lack of comp- confidence, Maybe. Yeah, confidence yeah, yeah. and stuff and just be like, I'm going to pretend I'm confident. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, I think it's possible. I do think as children in the U S depending on who your parents are, you are probably, more like, oh, you're the greatest. I mean, that's why you get the American Idol where they go up and they're awful, but they actually think they're good. Uh, but it, I, I think it's a cultural thing. Yeah, I'm going to tell you, it's kind of a related story, but I think it'll it'll work for this. I was yeah. listening to a, a podcast with the guys who made the app Headspace, the meditation app. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're British. And so they were here in the UK and they're trying to like get funding for their app and stuff like that. And they're having a hard time because it's, everybody's like, what? No, you can't do that. You know, that's not going to work any of that kind of stuff. And then they went over to the U S to get funding for it. And that's actually why they founded the company in the U S is because over there, they're like, oh yeah, you can do that. And then also have you considered doing this, you know, try this as well. And so it's, it's a very different cultural attitude of here, I think things are so traditional to an extent that it's hard to break out of that. And I think for years past, people weren't encouraging, weren't encouraging of their children, you know, and feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but that's kind of the impression I get. And it's, I probably more recently that that's changed. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it's this, you know, boarding school idea and the education system and that kind of stuff is, right. you know, just stay in your line, do what you're supposed to do and right. want to step out. And I, I, I don't think that's as much of a thing over the U.S. So that's my theory on that subject. Or they're really completely, they have no confidence whatsoever and they're just covering <laughs> it up by acting over yeah. that's, that, that's always a, a kind of possibility. I mean, the, <laughs> one of the things that you kind of notice about kind of music generally over here is that a lot of artists, British artists, have the same kind of trajectory in terms of how they're seen by the public and how they're covered in, in the news and stuff like that. And you'll kind of get somebody who, who breaks out, suddenly achieves a kind of a lot of um, sort of crossover success or something like that that um kind of like a lot of critical success for a time and then i think in the uk it seems to me we, we often kind of suddenly get quite annoyed with them <laughs> for being successful yeah. and then there'll be a huge kind of backlash and it's happened to so many artists um they'll suddenly kind of be a point where we're like you're now too successful so we're going to put you back in your in your box <laughs> yeah it's like you're not allowed to, you're only allowed to get so big and then it's like yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it no, becomes, it becomes down, annoying yeah. it's like, oh so you think you're big do you <laughs> yeah yeah well <laughs> <see not>. that. <laughs> <laughs> we've suddenly changed our minds so that happens and then eventually the person kind of either then kind of carries on for a long period of time and suddenly everybody then goes back what well, once they've kind of become the underdog again and they've kind of like their stars faded a little bit and, and you know often that kind of comes with other sort of challenging things and, and then we kind of like them again or they die you know and we nobody loves a dead rock star more than the united kingdom for some reason for us it's kind of like a, we're now allowed to like somebody because they're they're kind of uh uh, that that kind of mindset doesn't apply to someone who's not around. So it kind of and it's very sad. You see, you know, I think you know it could be a long time to, but but like with somebody like Amy Winehouse, you know, who was absolutely dragged through the press. Um, but as soon as she died, people were like, oh yeah, she was amazing. 
you know, which obviously she, she always was. Uh, but it's suddenly, people seem suddenly a lot more comfortable with saying that. Um, and it strikes me that maybe in America, there's more of a, a culture of generally celebrating success uh, um, in, a, in a more of a sort of straightforward way. Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, it's just something that kind of that is, interests me. And it, yeah, it kind of goes back to our previous sort of thing, you know, and, and my favorite subject, which is talking about insecurities and how much you hate yourself. <laughs> no, it, it is funny though, that you kind of bring up what you just said, because on our, probably one of our first episodes we ever did, we actually discussed the concept of the, the art and the artist, um, how you kind of like split the two. Yeah. Depending on that character, you know, things that they may have done in their life. And uh, no, it's really interesting that you touched on that because it's very, very relative to a previous discussion. And like you say, the Amy Winehouse thing is probably a massive example of the press really doing what the press can be guilty of doing a lot of yeah, the time. And definitely. That push and that push and pull element of you're a star and now we're gonna drag you down and then yeah, which is, is not a nice a nice thing at all. But like you say, once they seem to someone's passed on, they're like, oh, we can just like glamorize you again, like in this po- in this post humor. Sort of celebrate way. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Very strange. I don't understand it, it but anyway. Yeah. Very odd. Interesting. I noticed that with the uh, the Philip Prince Philip death actually, prior to his dying, kind of the press and a lot of people kind of ripped on him and made fun of him. And then mm. as soon as he died, everybody yeah. was like, here's look at all the great things he did when he yeah. was around. Yeah, very strange. I mean, I could, I could be, you know, I, I'm not kind of familiar enough with like, American culture to sort of know if that is a is a definite thing. Over, you know, if that's something that doesn't happen in the states, but it's definitely a thing here. Um, there's also a kind of a sometimes from certain elements of the press, there's a kind of a, a keenness to show how fundamentally how how we're all the same. Uh, how normal we all are, you know, which, you know, there's, there's no such thing as kind of not normal. I mean, the, the more you kind of, you know, on occasion that I've worked with kind of people who are famous or whatever, you know, you're struck by the fact that they are just a, a normal human being. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're not kind of, they don't have wings and, you know, laser eyes or anything like that. I mean, that, that's, we kind of really do build people up to be something more than what they are. Um, but there's, it kind of, there's still room for someone to be a normal human being and still have something special about them. And, for that, and it's, and it's, you know, I think it's completely fine for that to be celebrated. Um, but definitely in the UK, there's some very strange kind of conflicting ideas that, uh, that I think certain aspects of the press and, and the public maybe have surrounding that. Um, uh, but, and I think that probably is kind of cultural, you know, but, but yeah. Well, fascinating subject, fascinating, but now it's time for our badly drawn bamboo <laughs> section. Yeah. So you have um, <laughs> mentioned studying art and stuff. So I've set myself up for a full I, I, yeah, I'm I'm to this <laughs> one, Dave. Um, so <laughs> I'm anxiously, anxiously waiting to see your badly drawn bamboo. I th- yeah, here's my badly drawn bamboo. I don't know if you can see through the thing. So you've got an oar. I don't know if you can see it. So it's Kev, uh, and he's holding an oar. <laughs> I think that's Kev what? when he's 60. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I haven't done justice to how uh, handsome you are, man. But bear in mind, I haven't seen you in quite a while. I, that is, so you didn't take that off any, that was just kind of like almost like a memory. It was, it, was, it was from memory, so I was trying to guess uh, to, you know, as to what you look like now. Um, and, and I was wrong. <laughs> as soon as you came up on screen, I was just like, oh, that's a shame. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, the beard's, the beard's a little thicker. But, um, yeah, no, yeah, I, yeah. I, I like that. I like these, I like these kind of rougher sketches and, and, and uh, idealisms. So I'm, I'll, but, explain, I'll, I'll explain the awe, because you and I obviously met when uh, we were... Uh, younger when my family used to go to the Silly Isles on holidays, right? Um, and you, as, as far as I understood, am I right thinking you, you lived out there or still do? Or you I definitely don't seem li- very much part of like the, the kind of... Yeah, I was a big fixture of that place for a good chunk of time. I spent a good number of years out there working. And yeah, I would have, like many of us, would have loved to have lived out there permanently. Um, I think all of us have that. I think that's the main connection that a lot of us have that go there is that 
it's just such a fantastic place. Uh, Milo, the Isles of Scilly is a group, a small group of islands just off the coast of Cornwall. So right off the southwest tip of, of the UK. And if you get a chance to go, absolutely go. Especially if you want to just unwind and totally just kick your shoes off, run around barefoot, which is what I probably spent 95% of my time doing. Yeah. Um, it is just, there's no judgment. You know, it's literally... You can be dressed in whatever you want. You know, it's it's kind of like just go and chill and yeah. I uh, gave well, it. Yeah, wonderful place. And and it's uh, St Agnes where where we were we used to be hanging out. Was um, there's there's no uh, cars really on the island is there or like very very few and and you can kind of it's great as kids. You know, you, you can kind of just go nuts really and, and it's yeah it's, it's awesome so I, I i remember you as a kind of a, a surfing kind of seafaring uh yeah you know, muscle-bound man so that's what i'm trying for <laughs> but your beard, i was i was I, your your beard i've underestimated the beard man and you're gonna have to tell me you're gonna have to tell me a secret because i've attempted to grow like a proper sailor kind of beard situation for quite a while but it gets to a point um where is I, I sort of start getting a decent beard and then it grows at a right angle. I don't know what's going on. So I look like I've constantly kind of gone sideways really fast. <laughs> it's all that sleeping yeah. you've done in the, in the downtime. Yeah, it's <laughs> definitely that. <laughs> sort of sleeping game. My three-year-old kid. Yeah, um, but uh, what's, your, what's your beard secret on, on a tangent? What are we talking wow, here? Oil yeah, wax. Beard, beard secrets. Mm. Yeah, I suppose. I got Some kind of injection. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no um because i do have like under there i don't know if you see i do there's like a little yeah there's a patch that's a little clear there and I like that. There, are, yeah. there are a few areas that kind of aren't as strong as others but <laughs> yeah i mean it's it's, it's certainly time I, I think time is the only thing and and i'm one of those people who just i'm really not too fussed like i'll i'll just let it keep going and going and if somebody says hey you i don't like that it's like I've never been. I've never been one on that kind of aesthetic sense. Quite, no. quite clearly. Um, no, well, you're great. This yeah, is the thing. I, yeah. You know, talk about insecurity. I'm, I'm, I've got beard. Beard. <laughs> beard, beard. <laughs> really, you're really triggering me with that. Because <laughs> I'd love to have a beard, but I can never get I, past that point. So yeah. I'm sending beard vibes. <laughs> Good. <laughs> over the ether. Um, yeah, I would. I would purely just say time, and then yeah, a bit of brushing. You know, get, a, brushing. get a decent. A decent beard comb or even uh, my beard. I think the reason without, again, going elaborating too far, um, my beard, I, my hair naturally is quite curly. and Yeah, you know, you're very lucky. Hair. Mine isn't, and yeah. All, yeah, all of my, so my beard hair acts in almost the same way. It just keeps springing back up on itself. So I get this carpet that it doesn't actually grow that long. So I don't really trim it too often. Right, right, right. Um, other than maybe under the trim um chin strap yeah yeah, yeah but, for sure but literally it kind of springs back on itself so just brushing it so i actually use like the equivalent of basically like an afro comb like a wide tooth wide, wide tooth comb um and that and, and pull that through it and it hurts sometimes but yeah. then you get through that and then the other the other one so for anyone on milo yourself you know if you have to grow a beard Dude, a it would take me six years to get that to that length over here like but it could, it could be your breakthrough week, role yeah, like it could, it you could know. be your breakthrough role and you, you know you um but literally yeah um i would in the, say in the beard eight it's funny because like i don't really have any gray on my hair maybe a couple strands but my beard is like white great you really? know it's, yeah it's so funny looking I, I, think you look, cool. I, I think you look awesome with a, with a good old you know <laughs> A, a, Santa Claus, a Santa Claus job going. Do know. either of you guys have kids? Kevin, do you, is, is there a... I, I, I don't know. I... Right, right. Because I, I, I feel like that's one of the things, as soon as you have a kid, it's, you know, get heavily into jazz, big beard, barbecue, <laughs> a lot of doing a lot more barbecue. During lockdown, I was doing carpentry, which is like a, definitely like a dad. You know, that's that's like uh, no, I'm, I'm loving all of that. That's, yeah, I'm I'm all over that. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, just no kid. So. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> you've kind of got the best of both worlds in in many ways. Nice and tight, nice and relaxed, and well slept. Uh, but I, but I have got to. I, unfortunately, I or fortunately, I, I have got to rate your sketch of of bamboo. Oh um, right, okay. So put it back so up. You, you can, yeah, briefly if you like, <laughs> so I can give it a. 
Okay, so yeah, like I say, I love the rough sketch kind of idea. And considering you did it from, you know, freehand, and this is bad, <laughs> badly drawn bamboo. So if it was really bad, yeah. you'd have a low, you'd have a really low rating. So the higher the rating is, it's almost like this reverse, reverse badness. Um, yeah, I'm going to give you a, I'm going to give you a seven on that actually. I feel like that's good. <laughs> that's that, quite that is... safe. I'm kind of nestling in between, uh, like amusingly bad and and kind of good. <laughs> no, you, yeah. you definitely didn't fall into the badly badly drawn bamboo. No, of, yeah, <laughs> I don't think we've had a one out of ten or a zero out of ten yet. Is there, is there a place winner. where? Yeah, is there a place where you can? I mean, I'm interested to see where mine sits and in, in the context with the other ones. We you should is that on that? like a scale yeah, yeah. actually yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea we do need we do need a proper, a proper blue peter gallery of uh of, of of them coming across because we've had a few we show 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 a few in the last like last episode or episode before we had around about four or five the um guys kind of like sent in their own as well some of the viewers yeah. did as well and this week we've not got any additional ones but you know there's yeah we'll, we'll try and put up a, we may put up an end of end of season gallery or something like yeah, that, that you can yeah, check yeah. out and you can idea. see where you fall a bit like the kind of you know top gear top thing gear, where yeah. they did the <laughs> yeah, yeah, like yeah. star in a reasonably priced car but this is uh you know top end badly drawn bamboo feature <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I, I like those moments where you kind of find out where you say i had so as we were chatting about the other day during lockdown one of my things was kind of doing rubbish carpentry and i kind of got really into kind of slightly ropey uh dad carpentry and there was there was a, there was a kind of a brief period where i kind of thought oh, man, maybe maybe this is going to be my thing maybe I'm, i should just be like a a kind of uh you know like a chilled kind of carpenter guy and and, and my, my life would be a lot less sort of full on and, and it'd be great maybe i should do that and then and then i went online to look at all the other dad carpentry that's going on and it turns out I'm I'm really crap at carpentry, <laughs> so I, I kind of I'm carrying on, but my hopes of, of uh, making it as a carpenter on the side are sort of slightly faded. So the, the carpenter dream was it's quickly died, just, just just went. It was, <laughs> yeah, it was yeah. there. And it, it, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Not exactly. living that dream. No, that's that's one of the dreams. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna leave that one. No, because I, I do remember that you used to do a bit kind of when you was on, on silly visiting, I, I think mm. it, was, it was with Joff, I think you, you kind of helped, yeah. helped him a few times because you always had an interest in it, which is... You know, yeah, is there was, to, there to was one point where me and my friend Adam made a raft, uh, like yeah. really, really publicly on the beach because there's, there's a campsite by the beach Um and uh, that's where everybody was kind of camping. Your so, story is very similar to what, so carry on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm sure, I can imagine there's like been a few uh, kind of catastrophic raft <laughs> anecdotes from kind of people staying on the island and sort of pretending to be like island just for like a week and, and they go, oh, but, but yeah, with, with me and Adam, we, we made this raft really seriously. It's like, we were really into it and, and, um, and uh People were literally, you know, it was kind of became like a sort of daytime TV thing where all the, the campers were kind of watching us slowly assemble this thing. <laughs> and then we, with like huge fanfare, we like, we kind of pushed out and there were literally people with like binoculars kind of watching me like, these, these are the raft guys, like they've made the raft, now the raft's yeah, happening. The whole, the whole week was all, all, yeah, yeah, yeah. Prime yeah. uh, time. Yeah, <laughs> and it immediately sank. <laughs> but, but kind of, uh, we, we hadn't kind of, there were no reserves of kind of, can't we taken it so seriously that it was like way worse than if we just been sort of like a couple of dicks kind of drunk so sort of, you know we were really kind of like this rust can be sick and then like immediate yeah last yeah, Titanic. Very, a very similar story um i don't know if you remember um do you remember uh tiger tim pirate tim i do yeah of course yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. so absolutely yeah so so tiger tim and i uh pirate tim so yeah. pirate tim milo was another guy that worked on the hours of silly for a number of years and me and him became relatively good friends and, and we we also built a raft one year but it actually turned out to be tim was very very doughty if that right. is, is that correct word yeah, um, yeah. And, and yeah he, <laughs> he he absolutely he made this like three hauled catamaran oh really with, oh basically during the course of one summer so uh, on one of the bit larger islands there was like a small tip uh, like like refuse place 
Oh, and he wow. collected tons and tons of jerry cans and things and just, yeah, so to create the displacement there. And wow. The buoyancy was ridiculous. He really it really went in. It, sat in the, it floated and it sat in the water really low, but he'd made this kind of like little cabin, like little deck and everything. Wow. And so we just went out and sat on it and anchored up kind of in the little bay, you know, in Preglis and just took a few beers out there and sat out there and drank beers, you know, after that sounds amazing. In the afternoon. And it was, it was glorious. Sun was shining. The yeah, yeah, classic yeah. St. Agnes Day. The sun literally sets, you know, over the back of you know over the back of the campsite, so you get amazing sunsets and things, Milo. So it's just, I say that would be my version of living the dream in that moment. Um, yeah. yeah, man, nicely, nicely segue back. That is kind of I can imagine that would be amazing. Um, uh, I just I've got a real mental like, image of you guys. Uh, yeah, and like yeah, you sort of like built like an outboard motor out of driftwood, like really like proper kind of yeah. He, he had he literally made a, a bloody you know what's the wheel called you know literally, wow. and he had a he had a rudded system. He, oh man, I, He's I don't, I make don't an know. Amazing dad, that's like, that's, sort of, yeah. that's totally a fun I, kid project yeah, to be as a kid. Yeah. I had I have no idea when he went to work during that time because. He spent that, that summer was dedicated to building that boat. That was his mission. Yeah, that was yeah, his, yeah. That was his life project almost over that summer. But yeah, so living the dream, I am going to bring it back because we're going to go back to the survey and we've got another question on that. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. A few, a few more answers, and then again, we'll um, we'll bring it back to us guys. And yeah, so let's let's see what question two was. So we kind of went a little, a tiny little bit deeper, gave them an easy question to start off with. Then we said to them, so if you were or are living the dream, how do you think that would change or make changes to your outlook on life? And we gave two initial, yeah, two initial options of I'm not living the dream, um, but I'll comment, yeah, I'll comment below. And then some, and then the other one was I am living the dream, and then they're going to you know, give their expand on yeah. their comment. So again, we had you know we had a few comments, and I wonder now if the guy that we were trying to figure out what his dream was. Maybe he clarified further on that. Um, I hope he did. I hope he didn't skip the question. <laughs> it's, like, it's, like, it's teasing us. With it's the, so uh, mysterious, I, isn't it? Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm living the dream, but I'm not going to tell you my secrets. <laughs> <laughs> He's toying with us. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So, essentially, so we've got, you know, a, a few comments I'm going to bring up on there. And it's, um, so, I feel that my low, low self-esteem stops me living the dream. Oh, that's um, sad. Is, yeah, that is that is not the not what I wanted to read actually. There. Initially. Oh, that um, poor person. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's a, that's a, that's a, yeah, very common thing. And, I could, and, yeah, uh, I could imagine, and like you say, those conversations definitely should be had more, and people should be able to open up and be more, you know, be more honest, honest about those things. So kudos sure. to them for actually, yeah, being, you know, fully honest about that. Absolutely. And then we've got. If if I had a dream, it would be like most of us to make a living out of poetry. I assume he's talking about obviously is the sector that he's in, a bit like you saying with within music. Um, so no, that's a that's a that's a nice one, nice one to get on. I, I hope that he I hope that he or she does. Um, yeah, for sure. And then we have I'm I'm doing what I want to with my life, and I'm learning to do it without much apology. I'm accomplishing goals I have set for myself, and thus I am living my dream. So maybe that was maybe that was our guy. That's um, the guy, isn't it? Yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I same show, kind yeah. of, yeah, same flavor. You can tell. Yeah. And then finally, I think finally, I'll just check one second. There's a couple of others in there, but no, we'll go with that one. Okay, so this person puts, well, I am on my way to living my dream. For me, it might not be living the dream to others. The dream for me is financial independence, freedom to make choices to do the things I want. Time is a currency, so I look at where I'm trading this currency too much and then looking to pull back and give myself more time to do the things that contribute to me living my or the dream. So that was a good good one to end on there. Yeah. But yeah, so if you want a reminder on the question there, guys, um, it literally was, if you were are living the dream, how do you think that would change your outlook on life? So, Gabe, I'll go with you. So... 
If you were uh, looking, I think it's, it's, a, it's a hard one because it kind of depends on on what the what what kind of success means to you. Um, I think that definitely a big part of of my kind of um, jumped up kind of philosophy that I've I've sort of jumped up for for how I kind of go about pursuing playing and, and all the rest of it. Um, is to do with kind of acceptance, you know, and 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 a sense of of being able to kind of it, look yourself kind of in the face and and identify problems, you know. And and, and in this context, I'm talking about playing, but I think it also applies to just sort of you as a person generally um, <clears throat> to be able to kind of look at look at your. Uh, so as a musician, you know, look at your playing, look at a gig and kind of go, right, well, that wasn't great or there was an issue there. Uh, and this is what that was. But then to kind of make your peace with it and to kind of go, uh, but that's okay. And it's not the same as kind of giving up and going, ah, you know, it doesn't matter. It's more of a kind of a sort of um, a process wherein you you kind of accept the truth of it uh, and what I find often is that, is that, that if you really are able to do that, it, the, it becomes a lot easier to work at the thing, um, work at the problem. Um, it's very hard. It's, I find it still find it very kind of hard to describe. But there's a there's a kind of a removal of, of like kind of cognitive dissonance. If say say I'd have a bad gig and you kind of and, and I'm kind of go like, oh man, that was awful. Um, and the cognitive dissonance comes from uh one part of me is kind of going but i'm a piano player and i you know i see myself as being good at the old piano or whatever uh but the universe seems to be telling me that i'm actually you know there's a problem with my playing or or, or that i'm kind of having a kind of a bad you know that i wasn't good then or whatever um and and there's a kind of a cognitive dissonance wherein it's kind of it becomes hard to accept the reality of kind of what's happened um and I found that yes, if if I'm lucky, I can reach a place where I accept the truth of of, of like a negative thing, um, and it's and that feels very kind of freeing. I don't know if any, any of this is making sense, but like in in terms of like how success would feel, I think it would probably feel like a kind of a, a feeling of being at peace with uh, with where I am and and kind of. Um, where my career is and all the rest of it, uh, and a sense of kind of acceptance of it, because I don't think that there would be a point with me where I'd kind of I'd arrive at some kind of you know uh, finishing post of of having completed being a jazz uh, piano player or like a pop piano player or anything like that. Like I, I don't think those things exist, but I would hope to reach some place of kind of uh, content, content, um, and, and and kind of um, uh, acceptance of where I'm at. Uh, does any of that make any sense? <laughs> no, it, it does. But Milo, yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah, I think it makes sense because as, as an entertainer of some type, that contentment that you're able to do what you want to do, accepting that you're at a place, the best place that you're going to be able to be at within that and still be able to do it yeah. uh, for actors, for example, to be able to actually make a living as an actor versus potentially, you know, the, the rarity of being an A-lister or something like that, but you're still doing, working in the field and doing what you want to do. You, so that, that level of acceptance and contentment would be like, you know what, you may not be here, but it's pretty damn good to be here. Yeah. Versus that's definitely. Here, yeah. 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 You know? mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, th I think that's, that's really, true and, and it touches upon another thing which i think is that there's kind of when you think about kind of confidence in in anything um there's kind of different kinds of confidence and the best kind of confidence is like uh, is like uh, is informed you know um so when i was younger there's probably kind of times where i suspected i was like oh man i might be the next best thing in, in piano playing uh, but it wasn't informed it was just kind of like uh you know like a kind of a young 
bloke who kind of just hadn't kind of explored that world very much and and, and all I had was like a very narrow frame of reference um, as I kind of have gotten older and kind of moved through my sort of profession and stuff like that I now am able to kind of take some kind of confidence from a more objective viewpoint on my playing um, and where it sits in the kind of great scheme of things um, and part of, and, and, it, and it's kind of a more balanced sort of thing so I'm able to kind of uh, because I have an actual uh, informed sense that there are some things that I can do well, um, which has come from, you know, very kind of uh, uh, just kind of practical uh, situations. So, you know, if, if I'm booked repeatedly for a certain style of playing, then then the universe is telling me, oh, you actually, you can do this. And, and there's his kind of some actual facts and proof to back it up. Um, and because of that, it kind of it makes it easier for me, weirdly, to kind of accept the things about my playing or, or what I do, which I'm not happy with. Um, because it's more of like more balanced uh, and more kind of real and informed, you know. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, no, it definitely comes. It comes through that, like you say, that that evidence backing that yeah, there, exactly. you know, every, every yeah. time on his element. That's uh, as you progress through your own field. It's you know that gives you that that spurs the confidence. Like the confidence breeds confidence in in the you know in essentially you know it's always creativity is always going to be something that's what I feel is always going to be ever evolving. You know, like you say, you might not you might not reach that incredibly happy point or contented point but there will be a stage where you get to as like milo referenced as well that you can be doing something professionally in the field that you want to do that you love doing um which I'll, that alone obviously is is a huge you know a huge i think a huge a dream would be a strong word there but i think it is a huge dream of a lot of people to kind of take something that would initially maybe start as a hobby and that they can professionally do as a career. So if you can get into that level, oh, man, then yeah. that I was at, from a perspective that would that would seem somewhere that there's a level of contentment, even Definitely, if it's not yeah. a creative contentment, because that is, as I say, ever, ever evolving. But I I did really like the person's comment that we do we do think we've identified our <laughs> yeah. living living the dream guy, yeah. um, and 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 that comment about them saying that it's about the time part as well not as a as a currency you know actually you might be absorbing and putting every effort into something there but actually that might not be the right you know the right angle that you should be going you know investing in so recognizing when to kind of pull away from that and start drawing towards somewhere else and clearly there so in some ways maybe there is um a form of blueprint that on the outset we don't think that there is a blueprint to this kind of success yeah. or, or living the dream because it is all relative but surely you've got to recognize certain you know certain waypoints or avenues which go oh actually you know i need to pull away from that but now and start start coming yeah yeah place. carpentry is the way forward yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> we should do a raft bit raft making company yeah yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah. I, I'm going to partner with you on that. And, uh, <laughs> Mate, I yeah. will make a kill. Yeah. I'll have to work on yeah. the beard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bearded, bearded rafts. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, guys. Uh, so we've talked about your career a bit, Gabe. We've talked about the survey. Uh, so next question is, who is one of the best musicians you've worked with and who would you really love to perform with? Oh, man. Yeah. I, so it's it's a hard one because there are loads of musicians that I've I've worked with who I think are amazing and, and who I've been really lucky to, to end up playing with and and whom I really rate um, and they're all great for different reasons so it's kind of very hard to sort of rank them in that kind of way but but in terms of kind of uh, musical experiences of, of, of like playing with people live. Um, that I've had there are a few which spring to mind one of them was um, a gig I had just before COVID happened um, and it was it was through a friend of mine um, uh, and he basically he said he uh, American musician um, 
with this kind of uh, it's, it's this guy Mo Pleasure who, who's just uh, amazing player, lovely person. He's had this incredible career and, and he's kind of played with everybody. He's played with sort of Earth, Wind and Fire and Ray Charles and all these kind of people. Um, and he threw me this gig. He said basically Mike Phillips, uh, who who plays sax for Stevie Wonder and and, and who also played alto for for Prince. He's got a gig in, in, in London. Do you, do you want to play in the house band for that? There's kind of like an event kind of, uh, it's not like a, there's, there's, there's kind of a concert sort of night going on. And it was basically Mike Phillips and the house band playing with him and then playing with a bunch of other artists. Um, uh, are you up for that? And I was just like, yeah, like, absolutely. Um, and I'm a massive Prince fan as well. So, so that would, that would probably be one of the people that I'd love to play with, obviously, you know, even if that had been on the cards, very sadly, no, no, it isn't, but like in, yeah, fantasy land, Prince would be one of my people to play with. Um, and so I was super excited to, to play with this guy. Um, and we turned up at the, at the gig and, and, and I was just there, yeah, playing keys with Mike Phillips having the time of my life. And then halfway through the night, all the crowds were suddenly really quiet and I was trying to work out what was going on and, and I looked in the corner of the room and Stevie Wonder's entire band just like filed in um, and it turned out that obviously Mike Phillips is in town and, and the reason why he was in town was because Stevie Wonder was playing at Hyde Park and all his band were, were kind of kicking around so they, they all kind of rocked up um, and if, if anybody hasn't seen Stevie Wonder live like you know in, in, in person or like on, on the internet, on YouTube, or whatever, I'd recommend checking out that band because they are one of the best around. They're like, absolutely amazing. And, and I saw McGrath to be the previous year and it was just one of the best live experiences I've ever had. I loved it. Um, and so they, yeah, they all, they all kind of cropped up. Uh, and immediately uh, I had, uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> I was sort of very excited slash quite sort of stressed uh, because they then gradually kind of got up on stage and started playing with us and, and um, and and they kind of you know were sort of people in the house band were taking turns playing with these guys and eventually they were kind of all up on stage and there was one point where it was just me and Stevie Wonder's band on stage um, and it was amazing it yeah. absolutely beautiful and then we you know and then we were sort of there basically jamming with them for about three hours they were just sort of really loving playing um, and were incredibly nice you know really lovely people obviously amazing players like if one of these things with like a really good band like that is, is everything becomes so easy it just feels very very natural because they're all so musical so like uh it's just like an amazing kind of big sort of musical hug where you can kind of you don't really feel like you can go wrong because they're all musically so supportive and stuff like that so that was an amazing amazing experience yeah um but then, but then also, you know, I've, I've had, yeah, experiences of playing live, which have been a lot more low key, uh, like very intimate kind of, like there's a very intimate gig that I did with my friend, Adam, Adam King, this amazing uh, jazz bass player. And that was literally at my parents, just uh, sort of hometown in Somerset. And just me and Adam playing in a converted wine cellar uh, in Castle Carey and, and, and a, an audience of about 20 people. Uh, and for whatever reason, like it was just an amazing, it's just one of the best gigs I've had. Um, and we both were just really enjoying it. And but yeah, those those would be two. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, cool. yeah, it was it was really good. Uh, what's the other question? People that uh, people that I'd like to play with. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And and then so Prince obviously would have been one of them. And then and D'Angelo as well. I'd love to love to play with him. Don't know if you guys are familiar with with his music, but he's. Uh, yeah, if, if anybody is an amazing uh, uh, American neo soul artist from the states, and, and um, yeah, he had a, an album called Voodoo, which I've got here, and, and he it kind of came out in the sort of early noughties. Here it is. That's D'Angelo Voodoo. Definitely check awesome. it out. Anybody who hasn't, um, he hasn't got the. I like picture, how that's not just the, the CD, but that's the actual LP. Even <laughs> better. <laughs> Yeah. Next levels of nerd. I love it. But um but yeah, he'd be one as well. Just amazing musician, amazing kind of multi instrumentalist. Um and uh yeah. That's awesome. I mean, like you say, you mentioned the I like how you mentioned the two contrasts in terms of the low key gig as well as a really intimate one where you, you can kind of see everybody and all their you know, yeah. reactions and just the, the general vibe of being a beautiful moment. But then yeah, yeah. The, the amazing, you know, Stevie Wonder's, you know, Stevie Wonder's band. I mean, 
I, I, I too have seen Stevie Wonder at Glastonbury. I think it, I think that was in 2010. Possibly. I think it must have been the same gig, um, yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, I think uh, that was the one I yeah. saw. What a what a day! Um, it was amazing. I, I literally it's really interesting because my parents lived near Glastonbury, so we kind of go a lot every year, and 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 um, that kind of slot, the kind of legacy slot, like Sunday. I think it was a Sunday evening or whatever. It's often where you kind of have like a big household name comes and plays, um, and it's it's often amazing, but it's not always kind of life changingly good you know sometimes you get people who are like super well-known r- real kind of institutions but they just kind of don't quite deliver on the on the kind of promise or, or you know they're having an off day or whatever um and stevie wonder is so, so iconic you know uh, it's such a kind of the the his sort of like image and all the sort of stuff surrounding him has kind of got so huge uh, and I remember thinking before the game, I was just like, man, like, it's going to be interesting seeing him live to see if, if that stuff is all, if it has kind of got bigger than, than his actual, than he actually is um, in a way. I don't know. But, but, but he, yeah, he came outside of a stage playing a guitar. I don't know if you remember yeah. this, but it was the same. And, and, oh, yeah. And he, yeah, which was just like amazing <laughs> anyway. And, and he was like, um, and they, they were playing My Eyes Don't Cry No More which is like one of his lesser well-known songs, but it, it, a favourite of mine. And it was um, instantly amazing. It was like seeing a prophet. Like it was really, really, yeah, incredible. Yeah, it was, it was otherworldly, I think, that day. Yeah. Would be crazy because everyone, and I, 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 obviously you can't see everybody, but I feel like everyone was just totally sucked into that moment. And I, I'm sure there was, wasn't it something like 100 and, 130, 140,000 or something that were kind of like backed back. Like if you, yeah, yeah. I, I was near, you know, the tree mm, that's kind yeah. of like a good distance back, but the, 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 there's a synonymous tree at Glastonbury that kind of like lines up with the pyramid stage. And yeah, I was around that kind of area. And I remember just like looking over my shoulder like this and still it was going on, you know, yeah, man. And, yeah. and, but everybody was in such, I mean, festivals create that kind of environment anyway, but it was just, I'm happy to be, you know, to witness that, that live performance. And oh, maybe to, then, to bring this all back around for you to, you know, then performed with Stevie Wonder's band is. Yeah, well, it was um, amazing. Yeah, <laughs> I am, yeah, I'm like, I, I'm just, I'm feeling that, I'm feeling that moment then. So yeah. for, you, for you to have played, I mean, wow, the heart and everything must have been. It was mega. It was, yeah, yeah it was, it was really, yeah, it was, it was a funny combination of, of kind of, um, obviously very intense because it's, they're, they're fantastic and, and Stevie Wonder, anything to do with Stevie Wonder is just so amazing and kind of iconic and stuff. But it was also kind of nice because by that point I'd done this job enough to know that I was, uh, you know, at least able to function as a musician. So it, it was kind of, uh, the the you know and I, and I was able to kind of do that job of, of like playing piano on stage and keys on stage. So the the main feeling that I had was just like one of like um oh, like excitement and just like feeling very lucky and kind of privileged and and um yeah it was it was great um and, and they they were just, yeah super kind of kind and 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 uh, to everybody. Um, you know, they may have been doing a, 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 an amazing acting job and sort of secretly were gritting their teeth, <laughs> but like it didn't seem that way. It they were just generally really enjoying people who really love playing, you know. And and it sounds like an obvious thing, but definitely for like that's the biggest kind of one of the biggest tools in a musician's arsenal is is just love of doing it because if you love it, it does show when you're playing and and uh, it's something that you have to sometimes work at keeping alive, you know. Um, sure. it's, it, you never want it to just become like a job. Um, and, 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 you yeah. know, and, and rightfully so, you was you was there in your own right, you know, amongst there as, as an equal, you know what I mean? So, well, I, I, wouldn't, I nah. definitely wouldn't say that. But, but uh, as, hey, as, what, as what a musician... Were t- <laughs> yeah, what, what were you talking about earlier about having that, that confidence of being... <laughs> Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm, there. I'm on that. I'm on that level. <laughs> you, equally, you were there for a reason and, and the right reasons. So, well, but, man, who knows? How I'm these glad though. Up. I'm glad though because your your answer wasn't it wasn't a cheesy one at all. And uh, that does that does bring us on to our next segment as well. <laughs> um, 
Puns galore. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's such a palate cleanser. I like is, it. Yeah. Yeah, there, is string, <laughs> there is strings of, of, of cheese just, just wandering around. Oh, um, <laughs> but yeah, we're at that segment where we have to ask on this show that we always ask everybody, and it is Gabe. What is my mono's favorite segment? Yeah, I like how you um, said favorite segment on the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> And that can never turn down a turn down an excuse to fit in a, a pun somewhere. Good. Um, yeah. See, so I'd make a great dad. Rubbish. Yeah, man, pun. absolutely. You've got yeah, all the others. But, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, tell tell us what is one of your favourite cheeses or all well, many cheeses because this is a discussion. About. As, as in horrendous puns. Oh, cheeses? No, your yeah, yeah, your favourite. Yeah, your favourite. <laughs> oh cheese. man, oh god, I feel so relieved. You said something about puns earlier, and, and while you were talking about, it, I was mentally trying to prepare a pun, like, yeah. and nothing What's was your coming. Favourite uh, cheese uh, pun? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> almost, almost lined you up for a big fall the there. Yeah. Oh man, yeah. I was so relieved. Cheese, I can happily talk about for hours. Um, favourite cheese? I come from Somerset, so there's lots of good cheese down there, and I like uh, Godminster cheddar. Is is my favourite cheese, which is there's a yeah it's a, it's a farm nearby. Yeah, it's, it's a great cheddar, I tell you. Like and 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 you kind of they sell it up here as well. I see it in sort of like uh, middle class sort of farm sort of markets up in London, and, and that does. So I kind of get it here when I can. But um, and also like Borsan, which is like the lowbrow. I don't know. If, I feel like Borsan's like not like uh, legit if you're a, if you're a cheese. Snob. I really like it as well. I, so, I think uh, if you like, yeah, if you like cheese and you and you and you're very well in, invested in your cheese, then yeah, <laughs> but Boston's probably Boston's one of those that you'll go to and and just be like, yeah, I'll, I'm going to just grab this one. You raise an eyebrow, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but, but the but the interesting, so I, I want to know because obviously I've heard of different cheddars as well, and but what's the flavour of the of the Godminster? Um, it's quite. Um, uh it's got a bit of a, a kind of kick but it's not like overly acidic uh it's quite sort of creamy this is making me want cheese <laughs> it's really good <laughs> it's, it's it's uh i'm not i'm not like endorsed by godminster by the way i'm just like yeah 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 it'd be great to me but um I can I can recommend it, man. Yeah, if you see it, it's kind of like a purple kind of wax covering. Oh, okay. Yeah. I don't think I've seen it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or if it's I have, good. it hasn't registered. Oh, yeah, because obviously Milo, lots of different English cheeses that Milo yeah. will not have even kind of. Well, well it's nice. Much I mean, about, but... we went down to uh, a market that's in central London somewhere. Uh, can't even think whether it's actually called. It's you know outdoor, and they've got ton- some cheese vendors and stuff there. Yeah. So we bought quite a few different kinds of cheeses that, when we were down there. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Was that was that Borough Market by any chance? Borough Market, yeah, that's yeah, it. yeah, yeah. yeah. Hello. yeah. Mm-hmm. Nice, man. Nah, it's a, it's cheeses, a favorite. Some sausages, all kinds of good ah. stuff. Oh, yeah, it's the best. Course. I love it. All oh, right, guys, that's a fascinating discussion about cheese. <laughs> but let's uh, wrap it up here, Gabe. Um, you're going to close out the show for us with a with a piece, correct? But before you do, remind our viewers where they can go to discover more about your work. Mm. Uh, so I've got a website called uh, it's www. Uh, www.gabrielpiersmantel.com. Uh, and that's got yeah like a few videos and things like that um, and links to my Instagram as well on Instagram I'm Gabe PPM that's where they can kind of find the stuff about me and I generally sort of keep it updated with different bits and bobs I'm doing um, although I've been told to, to be more frequent with it I'm not great at social media so which apparently you know it's, it's a good thing to do but uh, I promise I'll, I'll try and keep putting interesting things out there perfect but, uh, yeah well, all right play us out mm. yeah <laughs> Yeah, we'll just take this moment to say thanks for all our guests for watching and we hope that you enjoy Gabe's piece as well. So, um, yeah, thanks again.
Uh, well, that was fantastic. What do we have coming up next on the show, Kev? Yep, on, on Rip It Up coming up, we've got two great guests. We've got uh, special effects artist Rod Matsui all the way from Hollywood, and then we've got the beautiful haunting vocals of the singer-songwriter Hattie Whitehead. So stay tuned for that. But we'll be well into our spooky season and, and uh, Halloween. So also stay tuned for a very Halloween special as well. So, yeah. Looking forward to it. 